tales for dark nights. Part 4. The truth will set you free. So, what's the plan? It was a big, hefty son of a bitch with a bushy mustache and a mop of stringy gray hair. Heavy dark bag sagged under his eyes and he reeked of B.O. and wood chips. I have no idea how he is able to ambush me without me smelling him first. I blinked. What do you mean? Brian told me to find you. I, I assumed you had a plan. Lafarge shook his head. Brian is a brains. I'm just eye candy. Where is he anyway? Is he on his way? My eyes sank down to the floor. When I looked up, Lafarge's expression had turned grim. Damn it. I guess that means phase two is on the way. Phase two? How much did Brian tell you? I told the story of everything that had happened to me. Brian's disappearance, the riot outside the restaurant, Lindsay attacking me, the man in the bowler hat. Everything leading up to us meeting at the lighthouse. Lafarge shook his head. Well, you managed to make every stupid mistake you possibly could, but at least you're still alive. Maybe that's why Brian trusted you, because he knew you were lucky. It certainly wasn't because he thought you were smart. I could see why he and Brian got along. Well, if we don't have a plan, then we should at least get out of this lighthouse. Agreed. I've got a safe house a few hours from here that should do until we figure out our next move. But first... He reached into his pocket and took out a white pill. He held it out to me. I hesitated. Don't worry, he said. It's a much milder version than the old batches. Won't drive you crazy for one thing. I swallowed it. We headed back toward the town in the cold moonlight. Lafarge held his strange device in his hand. A mess of soldered electrical components. He glanced at it from time to time. I looked around nervously as we walked the silent streets. It's okay, he said, looking down at the device. The town's clean. Not a single stingray for a few miles in any direction. And they only have an effective range of a few hundred feet, so we're in the clear for now. Stingray? Is that what they call the mind control device? Nothing gets by you, kid. Well, how do you know so much about it? Lafarge let out a short, bitter laugh. Because I helped create it. I climbed into the cab of Lafarge's rusty pickup truck and we drove off into the night. He stayed to the country roads and the branches made checkered shadows on his face as he spoke. 2008 scared everyone. Until then, the U.S. government had been living in a world of make-believe. We had defeated communism and stood alone as the world's last great superpower. We were the capstone on top of the global pyramid, free to enforce our will as we saw fit. And there were cracks in the armor. The towers, Iraq, Katrina. Yeah, but to the people in charge, they were just a few bumps in the road. No reason for alarm. Just tweak the strategy a bit, put a black guy in the White House, that'll calm him down. But in the fall of 2008, the financial crisis hit. Global commerce stopped for a few days. Stopped. Yeah, for a terrifying moment, the whole system looked like it could unravel. And every economist with a brain was saying the same thing. This is only the beginning. The old boys in charge had finally seen the truth. They'd been having a picnic in a minefield and the first one had gone off. Then in the 30s it was easy. The great engine of American industry was still churning. And there were enough resources to pull the whole world back from the brink. Not anymore. Whatever resources exist are concentrated in the hands of people who refuse to give them up. Maybe a few old billionaires would fund cancer research to win points with St. Peter, but uh, by and large, the financial elite had told Washington, We ain't paying for this mess. Figure something else out. But it was a riddle without an answer. Who could stabilize the system? China. China is a house of cards, one real estate bubble away from collapsing like the Soviet Union. India's a backwater pretender and the Russians are digging for oil, like a smackhead poking around for the last vein. Now nah, there would be no New Deal, and history shows that when a government can't govern, eventually the people rise up. Democracy and commerce were no longer compatible. One of them had to go. So a plan was hatched. The funds were allocated. 
A tiny research station was built in the desert. All of it authorized by a top-secret memorandum detailing the three phases of a desperate project. Operation Stingray. I was brought in for phase one. Testing and experimentation. I'm an engineer by trade, though I had dabbled in biochem in my youth. I detested the idea of working for the feds, but the money they offer was unbelievable. I flew out to Utah and walked through the doors of Defense Research Station 117, thinking I won the lottery. Yeah, it was weird from the beginning. They gave us a few vague directives, but never told us what we were actually working on. We weren't allowed to fraternize with anyone outside of our immediate team, and we were under constant surveillance day and night. Eventually, a bunch of us confronted the principal investigator, a man known to us as uh, Dr. Dreiser. We told him it was ridiculous to expect us to accomplish anything when we didn't know what we were making. So he arranged a demonstration. He sat us all in front of a table with a mouse cage on it. He wheeled in a bizarre contraption on a cart and started typing on a keyboard. Mouse froze still. Dreiser typed something else and the mouse very slowly began to eat its own paws. I was shocked and sickened. And I looked at Dreiser's face. He was grinning. The frightening, inhuman look of a man drunk on power. We were horrified. Several of us demanded to be taken off the project, but Dreiser told us all the same thing. You signed a contract. You belong to us. After that, they clamped down. We weren't allowed to call home, go outside, even talk to each other about anything other than the project. They posted armed guards in every room. And it was surreal and frightening, like something out of the Twilight Zone. Then one day they woke us all up and told us we had completed our contractual obligations and we were free to go. We packed into the back of an old army truck and drove away. <sighs> yeah, I suppose I shouldn't have been surprised when a driver stopped the truck, ordered us out, and told us to march into the desert. He sprayed gunfire into our backs and we collapsed forward in a bleeding heap. I was the lucky one. The shot went through my shoulder, missing everything important. I lay there on the ground as the soldier approached us. He popped two in the heads of every man down the line. I waited until he was at the guy next to me, then I sprang up and wrestled the gun from him. I gave him two to his head and then drove away in the truck. And when I got back to civilization, I saw the news was reporting the deaths of every member of the project and their families, all killed in tragic accidents. Car crash, house fire, accidental drownings. I had apparently suffered a massive heart attack, but I was the only one whose family hand died with him. It was a message. Dreiser was saying, don't even think of coming forward or your wife and son will pay. So I stayed in the shadows, determined to find a way to shine a light on this whole thing. I've been on the run ever since. They brought in a new team after us, and now it looks like they moved on to phase two. What's phase two? What do you think? Field operations. Crowd control targeted assassination. Using a ray to eliminate enemies and prevent the masses from congealing into any kind of threat. It's a remarkably simple feat. That riot you witnessed, for example. They didn't need to take over everyone's brain to do that. There was probably a single ray turning up the aggression of a handful of the protesters and setting the whole thing off. That's all they need. The ability to control a few key players at a few key moments, enough to tip things in their favor, 51% of the time. With the proper planning, you can control a whole city with a skeleton crew or maybe uh, half a dozen rays. Put a crew like that in every major city, maybe infiltrate a few foreign governments and die. Uh, yeah, well, I'm sure Dreiser thinks he can control the whole world like that. The scary thing is he might be right. Who's in charge of it all? Ostensibly, it's under the Defense Department, but I don't know how much sway they really have. A couple of them got spooked and tried to pull a plug a few months ago, then promptly died by apparent suicide. And maybe the president is calling the shots. Maybe he's under the raid like everyone else. Yeah, the closest thing to a leader the project had was Dreiser, and he was more mad scientist than anything else. 
Which you're already well acquainted with him, I believe. The man in the bowler hat. Bingo. He's a real ruthless SOB. If the thought of a man who loves power that much being given a blank check for it frightens me more than anything about this whole situation. I stared out the window. I'd been too scared to ask the real question. So, if it's a three-phase operation... What's phase three? The Fard shook his head. Whatever it is, it's big. The largest wing of the facility was behind a door marked Phase 3 Development. Dreiser was the only one I ever saw go in or out of there. There were whispers and rumors, but no one had any idea what he was doing. All I know is that if Phase 2 is already being implemented, Phase 3 must be near completion. We pulled off the road onto a long gravel driveway leading to a tiny cabin deep in the woods. Lafarge shifted the car into park. Listen. I know there's a lot to take in. I know it seems like you've set yourself against overwhelming forces, but they aren't invincible. They are weaknesses. They've made the ray a handheld, but the trade-off is that its signal is weak. They have to be near you for it to work, and that limits its effectiveness. And there's the bill. I had to dig up a lot of old biochem knowledge to create it, but it seems to work. If we can figure out a way to mass produce it and get it to the public, then we can turn the tables. And... Most importantly, we have the truth on our side. It was the only thing that kept Brian going. The fact that he was shining a light into the darkness. When he told me he was going to try to bring you to the rendezvous, I knew he must have seen something in you. Something that told him you would devote yourself to doing the right thing. He trusted you, so I trust you. He opened the door. So come on. We have a lot of work to do. That was a few weeks ago. Since then, we've been hard at work, improving the formula for the pill and spreading the word to whoever will listen. And we've been on the move, staying at the various safe houses Lafarge has scattered across the country. There have been a couple close calls, but we've managed to stay ahead of them. Now, I'm sure most of you think I'm crazy, but I wrote this to get the truth out there. There are still lots of unanswered questions, chief among them the nature of Phase 3, but I'll continue to update as we uncover more information. I'm sitting here now waiting for Lafarge to get back from town with supplies. It's been a tremendous weight off my shoulders to tell all this to you guys. I feel less alone knowing that there are others out there who share this burden of knowledge. Maybe some of you will help us resist. Help us start the ripple that will become the tsunami strong enough to defeat the whole operation. And it's strange. I'm looking out my window at the trees and even though I know full well what we're up against, I feel strangely hopeful. I'm hopeful that we'll be able to turn things around. That we'll spark a movement too big for them to control. That we'll be able to wake the people up and tell them the truth. No. No, 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 no. Lights. Lights. Lights outside. There's a helicopter. Voices. Soldiers breaking glass. No. Buller. They found me. God. Dear Jesus, God, help me. They found me.